Uh, the title of the painting is called A Philosopher Lecturing on the Orrery. In the middle is the Orrery, and around are children listening and, uh, and, and learning about the solar system as if it's a story time at a campfire. Uh, the, the painting is culturally and historically significant because it replaced classical subjects in a painting with one of a scientific nature. Uh, in the shadows, the, the shadows that are cast by this painting is by a lamp placed in the middle of the orrery uh, to, to represent where the sun is giving light. It, it really gives this dramatic look to it. Um, it's, it's an essential part of the display, but for no other reason than to heighten the drama of the philosopher's lesson. Uh, and one tiny little bit I love about this painting is that the phases of the moon here, Joseph Wright being very clever, is represented as the faces of every adult here in this painting. He's very, very clever. I really empathize, empathize with uh, Joseph Wright, especially with the subjects of this painting. First point I want to make is that under the right setting and atmosphere and mood lighting and what have you, the study of just about any subject can be made interesting. The second point I want to make is that the object itself, the orrery, is a machine designed to model the understanding of some aspect of the world, but transcending that of a star chart or a map you can find it in, in the book. Its intentions are to bring to fore the reality of what's in the books and in the mental models of the astronomer's head. But that the, the held heavenly bodies moving around the sun isn't just an idea, it's actually a real thing. And by presenting it as a model, as something that's in front of you, that you can rotate around, it suddenly becomes real, um, as opposed to just reading about it. And uh, that, this is, this is going to be the topic of my, my talk. Um, so let's travel to the 21st century with our satellites and our internet and our fancy mapping technology that Apple has given us. <laughs> <laughs> On my journey to map, model, and understand the world with the latest and greatest uh, minds and technologies, I ended up at Google's data arts team. Um, and today I want to show you a programmatic orrery of sorts. Um, Google held a conference in July which focused on using information technology to expose illicit networks uh, around the world, such as the social graph of drug cartels and criminal organizations. Um, I was introduced to this Dr. Robert Mugala. His name is down here. <laughs> um, and he, uh, he works with uh, PRIO, P-R-I-O, which is the Peace Research Institute of Oslo. And he's an expert on small arms weapons trade around the world. Um, and we, we got together and, and, and tried to figure out what we can do for this conference. And uh, we needed something flashy and we wanted to wow people. Of, and, and also to bring to fore a lot of these problems that Google is dealing with, uh, uh, with, with this conference. <clears throat> so we have this data set that looks something like this. And this is a data set that contains trades between countries for weapons um, over the course of 12 years, from 1998 to 2010. It lists the exporter of the country uh, of, of origin for weapons trading, the importer, the year, and as well as a weapons code, which um, the UN has these like categorizations for weapons. And, uh, a lot of these are like military grade assault rifles, civilian handguns, sporting rifles, and so on. Um, so I know that there is a story in this data. It's touching countless of lives. But, and, and I also know that uh, there's already a mental model in Robert Mugat's head. How do we make that real? So I start by mapping each country into a lat long, latitude and longitude. Uh, any position around the world in a globe can be represented by a latitude and longitude. Um, and, and map the data of every single trade onto a sphere and draw lines to illustrate which each trade uh, is going by every country. Now keep in mind that I'm doing all of this in WebGL, which is just a fancy way of saying accelerated graphics on the web. 
Um, this is a relatively new thing. It allows the high performance graphics. Uh, you don't have to download anything. You can just go to a URL and look at it in your web browser. It's really fancy, really nice. Uh, so long as you're using Chrome or Firefox. <laughs> <laughs> so here are some failed attempts at essentially trying to give the data a haircut, quite almost literally. Uh, I was trying to create form uh, and also sort of try to ignore ignore what's what's actually there, but actually try to see the data first. Now I'll, I'll get into the detail about this, is, but I'll just show you some pretty pictures first. Uh, and it's more failed attempts. Um, I ended up with something akin to this. I settled on an overall way of representing the, the connected countries, and I started working on cleaning up the readability of this data visualization. So early on, every country here represented by a different random color, and every line has those colors. It's sort of hard to see in this image. And this actually created a lot of visual noise and reduced visibility, uh, the readability. So, I, so that's something I want to immediately address. The next, I started uh, adding these uh, particles that fly around, they, they, they go down the length of these lines, and they give you a direction for the trade. Right? It's like, okay, so this uh, particles are coming out of here and it's going to that country, so it's, it must be going, these, these are the trades, uh, uh, these are the exports from that country to the, the imports to that country. And uh, I replaced the geometric representation of these countries. Originally, it had this like fancy hexagon thing uh, to something a little bit clearer with uh, political borders. And eventually, I want to add text labels and stuff so I can see like what country is what because you know not everybody is good at geography. I'm awful at geography. I come from North America. <laughs> uh, the really tricky part about uh, this was figuring out how to communicate the categories of weapons trade, civilian, military, and sporting, uh, that the UN had categorized. We eventually rolled up all the sporting weapons into, into civilian uh, category, and to, to further simplify things down, here's an early version which uh, the, the screen represent uh, civilian weapons, on top of that, military weapons in red, and on top of that, ammunition in blue. Uh, this gets really, really confusing because this, the colors start blending together, and they started creating colors that are out of context of this visualization. You start getting pinks and purples and who knows what else, and they don't really mean anything anymore. So that's not good. I'm going to do something do with that. Uh, eventually, we started. We, set, we just settled. Uh, I think this is probably my proudest part of my career is just to cut it out, just simplify it down, um, and make just exports blue, and then uh, exports red, and then imports blue. There we go. Uh, so it eventually looks something like this. United States and exporting weapons, or sorry, importing weapons from Spain, this visualization. Uh, and so here's a couple more images. Uh, this one is still from the multicolored, the tricolored one, different categories. Uh, eventually I ended up looking at something like this. Okay, so I want to take a second to refer back to this painting and remind ourselves that I spent all this time making it look visually appealing. For the same reason that uh, the philosopher, the philosopher lecturing on the Ori lit a candle to create a dramatic effect. Uh, that this data sitting somewhere in a spreadsheet is no more consumable than star charts in a book. Again, I want to make this real to people. And in this case, Robert is the philosopher, and I am the Ori maker. Here's what the final piece looked like. I'm going to refresh this, because it's all messed up now. Just be sure. Important part of storytelling. Yeah, it's still a little bit messed up, that's okay. Because the screen is too small. All right. Um, I'm not even going to full screen this. You can drag it over. Yeah, this is really messed up on the screen. I'm sorry. But you can go to this website eventually. And you can look at it in your, in your own leisure. Um, I want to talk about uh, some examples that Robert Ruga uh, verified with us in our in this visualization, told in orrery form. Okay? So, Sudan and Iran report a $15 million transaction of military weapons in 2003. Let's go look at 2003. It's right here, and Sudan, I think it's this country here. Okay. So there's Iran. In the genocide in Sudan is said to have kicked off that year. 
Let's take a look at the graph. Let's Oh, that's hard. Bam. 71,000% increase. Uh, and the death toll dropping spectacularly the few years after. <coughs> um, uh, let's look at Iraq, which had a trade embargo from 2002 and earlier, and lifted later when uh, coalition forces in NATO took over. Um, let's look for, let's just search here. Google will search, right? And no, it's not working. That's not country. There. Importing weapons from 2000, etc. On Guatemala is the most one of the most dangerous countries in the world, and has the highest gun homicide rate on the planet. Let's go look at Guatemala. Um, it has a 700% increase in imports since the end of the Civil War, uh, since uh, 1996. Today, criminal violence claims more lives in this country than at the height of the Civil War. Um, I'll skip ahead to Russia. Let's take a look at Russia. That's not Russia. <laughs> Ruskies are not there. Okay, whatever. Um, uh, perhaps one of the most staggering increases in official arms trade since the end of the Cold War is Russia. In 1992, reported uh, exporting less than $10 million. Uh, a lot of this is in the gray market, in off-the-record transfers. But by the end of 2010, Russia was exporting more than $142 million, which is remarkable as the sheer diversity of arms trade that it's selling all over the place. Uh, finally, let's go to the United States. Because, you know, hey, yes, it's always the villain here. <laughs> Explosion. Yeah. So, in contrast, the United States is the world's single largest arms dealer. By volume and value, it's also the world's largest arms importer. In 2010, for example, the U.S. imported, uh, imported some $605 million, but uh, exported $605 million, but imported about a billion dollars in arms due to the sort of voracious uh, domestic appetite for weapons. There you go. So, ah, where are you living? Okay, let's cut off here. Um, uh, I, I want to close by saying that these numbers are often overlooked by the UN because while horrific, um, the dollar number pales in comparison to the amount of money spent on jets and bombs, yet the number one killer in global conflict is still small arms. Um, I want to close this horrifying story and, and <laughs> turn it back to a lighter note. Um, in a sense, I've created a tool, a vehicle, for which uh, Dr. Muga can bring his stories to the public awareness and make it real to his audience. Um, Joseph Wright, the painter, who is acclaimed as a professional painter that expresses the spirit of the Industrial Revolution, uh, I hope that we, as creative filmmaking programming types, can become the creative technologists that express the spirit of the information revolution. So that's the end of my talk. Okay.